would like to get started with uh, introducing our presenter, Jennifer King. Jennifer is an award-winning landscape and wildlife photographer with a passion for teaching and inspiring photographers around the world. She speaks at many yearly photographers, uh, photography summits, and you can find her photography and interviews, tutorials, et cetera, um, on, in several magazines like Outdoor Photographer, Wild Planet, and many more. Jennifer was named the Black and White Photographer for 2020 in the US, so congratulations, that's incredible. And she is also the founder of PFABC, which is the photographer for Fending Against Breast Cancer. Um, Jennifer will be talking all about creative composition today from the basics to advanced techniques. So thank you so much for joining us, Jennifer, and I'm going to toss it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Paige. Welcome, everybody. It is so good to be here sharing photography and creativity with you this afternoon. Noon. I see someone's from Reykjavik, so I guess it's this evening over there. <laughs> Hope you're having a good northern light year. Um, anyway, again, it's so great to be here, and I'm excited to talk about creativity and to see new friends. I see some friends coming in and others I don't know yet, but happy to meet you all. So give me just a moment. I'm going to share my screen, and we will get started. Play. All right, so it should be working now. Um, today I'm going to talk about creative composition. And it's not what you photograph, it's how you photograph. What is it that makes one photograph better than another? I mean, is it the lens? Is it the camera? Is it the skill of the photographer? You know, many of the places that we photograph have natural beauty and we can all take really nice photos, but a great photo takes, it takes creativity, creative composition. That is the process in which you photograph and the process can separate a good photograph from a great photograph and a good photographer from a great photographer. So how do we learn to be creative photographers? Well, first we begin with the foundation. These are the fundamental elements of composition. I always refer to it as like building a house or painting a canvas. Um, and then we begin with adding in framework. This is where we start to incorporate structure. These are the design elements in photography. Aesthetics. This is where we begin to apply creative elements to our canvas, so to speak. And finally, vision, because this is where, as photographers and artists, we are going to creatively grow. Now, there are many elements that are going to affect our photographs. Everything from your subject to your settings, um, from lighting and conditions, but there is always going to be one element of photography that is absolutely needed for a great photo, and that is composition. The foundation is the beginning, and this is the place where tried and true methods are considered and applied, a place where we historically begin our journey today. So I want to step back in time and review where it all started, because I'm a firm believer that understanding the past and knowing the evolution of visual arts not only provides us with information, but it gives us a starting point that most every photographer, even the pros, begin with when they first pick up their camera. So I'm curious to know who knows what this number is, 1.618. If you know it, go ahead and type it in your chat box, 1.618. It's a very specific, important number in history. Anyone making any comments? I can't. Yeah, the golden ratio. <laughs> yes, good job. It is. 1.618 is also known as phi, which is the golden ratio, which is also the Fibonacci sequence. So I'm sure we all remember Tom Hanks and the Da Vinci Code. This is when it became more popular knowledge of what the Da Vinci Code and the golden ratio was. We get that through the movies. <laughs> but anyway, it's true. It's the Fibonacci sequence. It's, you know, zero plus one equals one, one plus one equals two, and so on. Where does it come from? And more importantly, why is this number so important? 
Well, it's a place of learning. Learning, not just from history, but from the masters of science and history, knowing where we have been and the possibilities it can open. So during the Renaissance, artists like Botticelli and Da Vinci, they were using the science and theories of their time to help them create paintings that represented history, while also allowing themselves to take creative liberties, of course. So we have that foundation of phi, the golden ratio of Fibonacci, and we have to ask ourselves, why did it change from golden ratio to the rule of thirds? When and how? And what is the significance? You know, it simply comes down to the new questioning the old, right? Every generation has new artists that come in and we see new movements. Photography, that was the new visual art. And fine artists around the world either criticize this or they embrace the change because they understand that art is an evolution. The artists that embrace this change um, were actually impressionist and cubist painters. And this was after photography became a visual art of its own. So after the introduction of photography, the rule of thirds actually became the normal rule of that era. But what we discovered during the process of change in the visual arts is that this scientific Fibonacci sequence repeated itself throughout the natural world. And we see this formula throughout the history of visual arts from architecture to painting to photography and in nature itself. If something as beautiful of the feathers of this egret can form the same shape that is visible in, in a rose or in a nautilus shell, isn't it reasonable to assume that this shape holds appeal to our eyes? It's a natural visual appealing shape that we relate to and it creates a sturdy motion within when we see it. And what is really amazing is that once we took the leap forward from Renaissance, Renaissance art to the 20th century, artists like Van Gogh um, began to explore their interpretations of nature that did not follow the rules of art, of fine art especially. So understanding these transitions in art and the visual arts throughout history, it gives us a foundation on which we can grow upon. I, like I said before, don't we need to know where it all began so that we can move forward and create new things? And just for definition, I'm sure most of you know rule of thirds, but the rule of thirds is dividing your horizontal vertical space equally into three separate parts where those cross points or those teal colored circles are a place where visually the hero of a photograph could be placed. Um, there are studies done in visual arts where the eye movement actually has a flow to it and these cross points um, are a place where the eye will stop if you have something on it. So it's kind of interesting information. Now, I know the rule of thirds, it, it gets you know a lot of either good review or bad review. I like to call it a tool. I call it the tool of thirds. It has a foundation in history, primarily photography, but the roots of this date far back and understanding the evolution of art is a necessary part of growing with our own artistic endeavors. Sometimes this tool works and you know, sometimes it's completely unnecessary. But I think that knowing it's okay to consider this or to question its use is every artist's right. Um, you're the artist, you decide what works right for you and for your photo. Now, when it comes to landscape photography, horizon lines, you know, they're very important because this is how we communicate depth and dimension. Um, remembering there are no rules, but tools formed in history. 
and research that allow us to make decisions on what is right for us. Take mirror reflections, for instance, you know, these are a fantastic way to showcase the beauty of nature. And there are going to be moments when the horizon is completely irrelevant. Like in this photo here out at Mono Lake in California, um, there's a lot of dominant lines in this particular landscape with the tufas breaking the border. So the horizon is less important here as it may be in other photos that you're, you're composing. But there is one thing I can say from experience is that sometimes you have to try the methodology behind creating the photographs and practice these rules from the past so that your foundation of understanding is strong. Um, and the choices will be yours to make. I can guarantee this. Almost every professional photographer has tried these so-called rules or tools. And once they reach the point of knowing that it's not always necessarily needed to create a good photograph, they disregard them. But remember, they learn from them. They even practice them until they reached a point they no longer needed them. So now that we've talked about laying the foundation with basic design principles, we can start incorporating the framework. We're going to start to build this image, build the canvas, build the building, so to speak. Um, so you begin with your subject. And this is the iconic Schwabacher landing out in the Grand Tetons. I hope everyone has been there. It's an amazing location. Um, but then I want you to start incorporating structure, you know, design elements like line, foreground details, and balance and form. Design elements like the use of foreground details, for example, you know, really help to communicate dimension that is so crucial for landscape photography. Um, having a really strong foreground, middle ground and background, um, it creates depth and it increases the vastness of the landscape. Foreground, it adds drama to your image. I mean, I think the best way to enhance your foreground is to get low or close to the foreground subject because this allows you to play with spatial relationships by exaggerating the entrance to your image. And another wonderful thing that a strong foreground will do besides create dimension, it can actually create a sense of placement. Um, anytime you provide something in the foreground, the viewer will feel a sense of connection to your image. So foreground details to me are extremely important because I wanna give, I wanna give you the viewer a place to step into the landscape. Uh, something for you to reach out and touch so that you feel like you can be a part of this photo. I always say I get to go to the most amazing places. So when you're looking at one of my images, I want you to feel like you can be there too, that you want to reach out and touch the flowers here at Mount Rainier or wherever I may be photographing. Because I know if I use these details to incorporate some reaction, you can potentially have an emotional reaction or connection to the image. I want you to go to Mount Rainier. It's amazing to photograph. And hopefully by placing the elements in the right position for you to be a part of or to touch, you'll feel like you wanna be there too. So that emotional connection is very strong. Again, this is all framework, but one of the best things you can do for framework is to use those lines. You know, we talk about leading lines all the time in photography, but you know, the use of lines in your image are actually the most effective way of catching the attention of a viewer because your eyes are always going to follow a line. I mean, do you remember when you're kids and maybe with friends or siblings, you're trying to have that staring contest, right? Well, that's really hard to do. And that's because our eyes are not made to stop. 
they're made to move. And if you give the viewer something to move along with, such as a line, that viewer is going to look at your photo, become involved in your photo. Um, and that is a really fantastic thing because we want you to stop and look at photographs. Anything you can do to incorporate that emotional response, the stop of the eye, makes your photo more compelling and more inviting. So it's, it's really amazing how much the eye plays a part in great photography and understanding how the eye moves it never stops. And I referred to the tool of thirds before in those cross points, because there are actually studies that show that the visual movement of an eye almost mimics a spiral, but it will stop on one of those cross points that you're using. So lines give the viewer direction and it gives them something to follow. And it's very effective if you have a leading line that points the viewer to a specific subject. But you know, even if the lines don't go anywhere, the eye is still going to follow. So that line is an extremely, extremely strong tool for visual arts. Um, actually in advertising, they know this, <laughs> they use it all the time to capture our attention. In advertising, they have learned and studied that there's like less than a second for a viewer to look at a TV ad, a print ad, whatever it may be. And if they don't capture your attention in that time, they get no return on their investment. So a lot of this comes from studying not only the visual arts, but advertising, eye movement and everything else. Um, but it is interesting. And, you know, whether the lines around you are man-made or natural, you can still find ways to incorporate them into your image. And lines really are one of the strongest structural elements in visual arts because it draws the viewer in. It's going to hold attention. And often just simple lines themselves can create really striking images. Let's take this image, for example. This is out in Colorado. Uh, so the first thing I do when I photograph, I'm always trying to think of creativity and I'm going through my process of everything from the foundation, which is so built into my memory at this point. I guess I don't really think about it anymore, but I do start to consider framework. What framework can I use? Well, the first photo I'm gonna take here is gonna be the mirror reflection because you know, they're mirror reflections, they're made to be awesome. Um, and then I'm going to move around my scene a little bit and see what I can't find to, to create some dimension, some depth. So moving around the lake, you know, I'm able to move that horizon line up instead of in the middle of the page. And I have created dimension by changing my horizon line. And I'm also walking around a lake that has some stones around it. So what's amazing about that is not only have I changed my horizon placement for depth, but I have given it a leading line. So now there's a leading line going around the lake. There's another design element, more framework in this particular photo. And instead of just standing at the edge of the lake at eye level to get a photo, I'm gonna use those rocks in the foreground as a foreground element. So in other words, instead of standing at eye level at this point, my tripod is low to the ground and it is very close to these foreground rocks so that it stretches the size of them. Let me get my cursor over here. Otherwise they'd be really small like this if I were standing up and it would only take a little bit of space. But by increasing the size of that, it increases the entrance to the image and to the scene and can also help a viewer feel connected. And this is what I like to call layering. Right now I'm layering all my framework, all those design elements that I've talked about. Framing, well, let's talk about framing a little bit because a well-framed image really helps to create visual balance in a photo. Um, framing, of course, is first done while we're taking the photograph. I always watch the subject, especially wildlife. I watch and I study that subject. I wait for the moment when the framing can enhance the drama of that moment. 
And when you consider framing during your shot process, you can often capture moments that are rarely duplicated, especially in nature. Um, and this makes for a special moment for the photographer actually, as well as creating a compelling photo. Uh, framing, of course, can also be done during processing. And I always say, don't be afraid to frame the image any way you want. You are the artist. It's okay to cut off part of the image if you feel it makes a powerful photo. You know, when you were processing your photos, ask yourself a couple of questions. You know, does this photo communicate what you wanted it to? Does it work? What would you have done differently in the field if you can achieve that you could achieve now in framing or reframing? I always see it as a second chance, right? Second chances are good, but you can try it behind the camera, but you also have it in processing and it's a very mental process. It's not cropping. It's thinking about what you might have done differently with a different lens that you're using. Um, you know, a lot of times our lenses only have so much reach anyway. What would you have done if you had a lens that you didn't use? You know, these are creative thoughts that you do behind the camera as best you can, but you have that second chance when you get to your computer and start to process. Negative space. Oh, negative space actually really has such a strong impact on the viewer because simply less is more. And it can also create a sense of mystery and anticipation. I mean, these reactions that negative space can create will help your audience to stop and look, kind of wait to see what's on the other side of the image space, right? They wait, they anticipate, and they can enjoy that feeling that you have created. So you'll notice I'm talking a lot about emotional reaction and feelings just from using these structural elements that I'm talking about, this framework. Um, but it's always with the intention of cre creating some kind of emotional response. Um, I always like to consider the concept of creating windows into nature. That's something I work on a lot. And there are so many places that you can do this and so many different things that you can challenge yourself with. But that window into nature, to me, you know, whether it's light or a creative element, it's one of those things that almost works as effectively as a line, like where does that go? You're giving them a leading window. There's some mystery behind it. Um, and it, you know, when it comes to framing, whether you're using a window to frame or you're using something else to frame, you know, the framing itself can be subtle or it can be obvious. You know, sometimes the elements that frame our subject are actually more important than the subject we're framing. And Jennifer, you actually have a question about the framing. Um, do you feel restricted to the standard photo sizes like 11 by 14 or 8 by 10 when framing? You know, that is an excellent question. And the answer is no. Now, I know a lot of the images I'm showing are a certain format. Um, and personally, I do tend to stay within that format. It's been a little hard for me to break it, but I do break it sometimes because you have to do what is right for the image. And every image is going to be a little bit different. So if you know that you are going to make a print at a certain size that is different than what your camera is capturing, then go ahead and select that when you get to Lightroom or your processing software so that you can see what it's going to look like. Sometimes things look better square. Sometimes they look better in 16 by nine. A lot of times I try and um, visualize that while I'm photographing. And sometimes I know that's what I'm gonna do just from visualization when I get to processing. But I think that as an artist, you should always do what you want to do for one and two, what looks best. So always play with different perspectives and different sizes. Excellent question. And if you've ever looked at my work, I 
love doors and windows. Seems like everywhere I travel, especially places like, you know, Italy and France and Scotland, I get over to Europe where there's so much history. I have this favorite subject to photograph where it's doors and windows, because to me, they're like windows into the unknown, right? I mean, this is a time in history. I took this in Scotland with an infrared. Um, this doesn't exist anymore. This time, who lived there? Who looked through the windows before me? What did they feel? Who were they? All of that is gone. So now it's just a mystery. But actually seeking this out, I can relate to the mystery and the history and try and capture that and make a little drama out of it. But, you know, these arches, these windows, they can be obvious. Um, but, you know, it's more about what you see on the other side. Uh, shooting through or creating that window, it's a form of illusion and it can leave the viewer feeling a sense of anticipation. Again, trying to connect with some emotion when it comes to the viewer. Let's talk about aesthetics. All right, we've laid the foundation and we applied some structure with our framework. Now we begin applying aesthetics and this is the art behind the lens. So let's start talking about color. Um, let's just take this shot for example. This is what I would consider a color burst because this can create really dramatic photos and it can lend that mysticism to a, a location or a photograph. I remember I, I'm the type of photographer who will, one, I monitor the weather constantly and I will position myself to try and capture nature's drama at every turn because it just adds so much to the images when you get something like this. So our friend in Reykjavik that's watching, I'm sure he's recognized some of these photos, but this is down in South Iceland south of Vic. And I remember waking up after a two hour nap for sunrise, <laughs> I was driving to a different location. And when I was checking, I saw fog, I looked at the app, it's like, oh my gosh, we have fog, we have to change direction, go down to the coast. So when I was photographing this image, I realized with all the fog on those sea stacks, and the light that was backlighting it, when I was photographing this image, I thought to myself, this must have been what fishermen for centuries in that region have experienced. And I wanted to capture that because there's a story in that. There's mystical powers and all that great stuff when you capture all the amazing things that happen. But it's a lot of times it really does come down to the color. This again is aesthetics color. Um, but using whether it's a color block or contrasting colors in the landscape, um, it just creates a strong image. I mean, notice in this particular shot in, um, where was I? That's Glacier National Park in the fall or just outside of Glacier. Um, notice how the eye actually goes right to the color. And we have complementary colors going on here. We've got the blue and the yellow that are, that are complementing each other. So it's interesting how the eye goes to the color. And that's another interesting thing to understand how to use that color aesthetically. And here's another example in Italy. You know, notice how you stop to look when the color is bright. I mean, we all do. Yes, I want to say this, not every image has to be an HDR and not every image should be an HDR. I realize that there is a place for HDR and it works, but I also want photographers to start exploring that artistic side that color can offer. So go ahead and allow buildings or locations and objects to fall into almost a dark silhouette and make the image about color because again, Bold, bold, bright, vibrant is really eye-catching and it does tell a powerful story. I think some of the most powerful images that you take are going to be about the color and everything else becomes secondary. Let's talk about monochromatic too, because on the opposite spectrum, you know, where you have color aesthetically used, 
Another artistic approach to photography is through the simplicity of color or monochromatic color. Um, as the artist, you have the ability to pull back some of the saturation or some of the color in processing and make your image a little more muted in color and tone. And for this example here, the white horses in the south of France, notice this soft and dreamy effect that it creates with just subtle color. I've converted a lot of these to black and white, but sometimes it's nice to show that little bit of gold or just a splash, just a little bit of muted color. It can be very appealing to the eye. Now, of course, black and white photography um, falls into this style of art as monochromatic. But the difference, I think, between black and white photography is the amount of dramatic response that you can get. And black and white photography is approached in many different ways. You know, you've got high key effect, which allows your image to be focused on the simplicity of nature. Um, which is also very representative of minimalism, which is a style of art that developed in, in the 50s, actually in New York, and was soon taken over by the photo industry as a style of photography that is a lot of fun to practice and do. Um, but you can also, on the black and white spectrum, go to low key processing. And that actually, this darkness, the richness here, it creates that um, intensity, that emotional response of intensity in, in storms and in a drama that can barely be duplicated by other means. So, you know, you're really creating some mystery, drama, action, power when you go really, really dark. And again, it's the mystery that can be so well created with black and white. And I think we all came to black and white photography, at least in the beginning, we all followed Ansel Adams probably and all the work of the masters over the years. So it's very easy to relate to it, but it's also important as a black and white photographer, and I'll go back to this photo, is for you to look at what you're photographing and try and determine what you're feeling at the time. Do you feel like it's bright and light and sunny? Or do you feel moody and dark and want to represent that? Because that impact you have when you're behind the camera is usually the vision you're going to interpret for the viewer when you're processing your photo. Oh, light. Best friend, right? <laughs> Photographer's best friend, sometimes our enemy. I guess it depends on the day. But understanding light and paying attention to the way that light can enhance your scene, it allows you to position yourself to capture and maximize its beauty with nature. Um, backlighting actually is one of my favorite styles of photography. And I try and do that every chance I get to because it really does create dramatic lighting. So I always say, don't be afraid to photograph towards the sun, even if the subject or the scene isn't just a sunrise or sunset. You can utilize the sun for backlighting to create some great drama. And I think the results can sometimes be quite powerful. This is an image shooting directly into the sun, Yellowstone winter. So it gives it this, you know, nice light behind the tree. It's just a different feeling. It's a sense. It's, a, it's an artistic approach to this particular location. And then, of course, there's soft light or side lighting. To me, this is a really natural way to use the sun for photography. And sometimes with the right conditions, you know, the sun can create a muted palette that can be very appealing to the eye. This is Valley of Fire, if you haven't been there. It's an amazing park. But you know, when I talk to photographers, and whether I'm teaching or whether I'm with a group, I always tell people how important it is to pull the eye, pull yourself away from the back of the camera. Typically, as photography, photographers, we see something and we start photographing. But once you see that, there's probably 10 other dramatic things going on around you. 
And it's hard to see if you're still looking behind the lens. So I, I think it's important to capture what your eye first sees. Give yourself a little time, but pull your eye away. Look for the drama because when nature presents dramatic lighting, you just have to follow the highlights. And the use of light and shadow can also create some pretty interesting photos as well. So shadow um, and the contrasting shades can reveal shapes and curves that define what your image is actually about. Focus. And Jennifer, oh. you had a few questions um, sure. just about the lighting. So what is your opinion about uh, the comparison between the original view, natural looking, and the process photo? Well, my philosophy is always that uh, the photographer is the artist. That, I think, is the most important thing. A lot of photographers want to replicate realism, and I think that's fine, absolutely fine. I do it sometimes, too. Sometimes I'm in the mood to go for an artistic approach to something, in which case making alterations or adjustments and processing to color is completely acceptable. You know, it's, it is a tricky situation to be in because we are, we're not necessarily painters. Um, and that was a, maybe a previous visual art, even though a lot of us are still painters, but you look at something and you have your own interpretation with a brush. But when we start photographing, usually we're trying to capture what we see. So we begin with realism as an artist. And it can be a little challenging sometimes to move to that next stage to saying, OK, I'm being a realistic photographer today right here with this subject. But I can also be an artistic photographer if I think of ways I can creatively make adjustments. So that is my perspective on using real colors. And it is a personal preference, but I do encourage people to try different things. Try some of the settings in Lightroom that allow you to look at colors differently. Try pulling back on saturation sometimes or increasing your blacks for some intensity. There are a lot of tools and processing that can allow us to look at things a little different and more so in processing than in the field because we're seeing realism behind the camera, but in processing, we have the chance to look at thing art things artistically. And that's where if we do a lot of playing with different tools, we can maybe start to see things a little different inside our artistic mind. And that can affect us when we get back out to photograph in the field because we have that vision of something we want to accomplish. And then one more question is, um, <laughs> what app do you use for weather? Well, I use a couple of different apps. I, I use, um, I do keep weather.com on. It's not very <laughs> accurate, but it's on my phone. Um, I actually rely on NOAA, N-O-A-A -A weather app. I find that to be the most reliable. And I usually go between the two of those. And of course I watch local news, everything else. I check the dew point that's going to help me determine whether there's going to be fog, the dew point, the temperature, conditions like that. Um, but I, I will say that knowing and understanding weather and making that the primary decision maker before you go to a location has, can, it certainly for me, has allowed me to capture some scenes that I wouldn't have otherwise captured. So I think that's really important. And there are a lot of apps out there, but I think the more you compare, the better you're going to get results. Usually if two match, you're good to go. <laughs> but that's not always the case. <laughs> Great questions. All right, so let's talk about focus because the type of focus that you choose for your scene or subject, it can actually define an artistic style for your images. And using a shallow depth of field, for me, is one of the most creative ways to isolate and enhance the simple subject, the simple beauty of the subject, right? It takes away the busyness, in my opinion, and you are left with line and color. And usually, in my opinion, whether the focal point is obvious 
or even just a suggestion, that's okay. Because at this point, we're looking at aesthetics. We're talking photography as fine art. And ultimately, each choice that you make will begin to define a style of photography um, that actually becomes your own style. Exposure, extremely great tool to help create some mood and add some aesthetics and artistic style to your imagery. And, you know, this way, this dra dramatic water with long exposures, this approach can be so aesthetically pleasing, in my opinion, because you have created art. You're not just seeing the movement of water. You're not seeing the splashes, the speed. You're not trying to tell a story anymore. You're trying to interpret what you're seeing in an artistic way. So one of my favorite things to do is long exposure photography. Every time I'm in water, every time I have clouds moving through a mountain, anywhere where I can enhance that feeling of artistic versus realism, I will use that. You know, I just want to mention real quick too, that the definition of aesthetic is the appreciation of beauty. And beauty can come in many different forms. Uh, some words to describe aesthetics are graceful, elegant, um, beautiful, stylish, and of course, artistic. So as the artist, we get to decide what is pleasing to us. And we pass that on to the people we share our images with. And I want to stress this. There is absolutely no right or wrong, only the creation that we choose to share. Does everything have to be tack sharp? No. Can we allow blur and motion to create beauty? Of course we can. Sometimes the beauty lies in an unspoken moment, right? Weather. So let's come back to weather. I know I talked about it a little bit, but I will always say that as a professional photographer, learning how to predict weather, fog, especially how to track storms, um, this is the key to finding nature's very best drama that is around you. And when you find this kind of drama, these weather elements occurring naturally, um, you find drama. It's already occurring for you. You just have to go there and take the photos. And weather can dramatize any landscape. And even sometimes it becomes the subject itself. This is the Smoky Mountains. And I go there a lot. I'm not too far from the Smoky Mountains. And last year, this particular cloud that looked like an eyeball just just moved all across the sky. I mean, we were mesmerized by it. And it also, to my eye, looks abstract right now. Without explanation, you may not know what it is, but I have taken this an aesthetic approach to this as well versus a realistic approach. I used black and white to process. I use long exposure to kind of draw the clouds out a little bit more. But I will say this. Whatever you're photographing, whatever you happen to, wherever you happen to be, whatever your subject may be, it's always going to take on a different look in different weather conditions. So I always go back to the same places and photograph because I know that if the weather is different, it's going to look completely opposite. And I have so many photos of the same place with different conditions of weather. And it's like, oh, it looks so good in the fog. It looks so good with the wind. But again, understanding that weather can impact your photo understanding how to put yourself in the right place for when this drama has happened, it can create the most magical photos. And these photos, when this stuff happens, when lights and magic occur in weather, these are typically the moments in your memory that last in time, right? It's not just for the viewer, it's for us. These moments, they rarely get duplicated and they are ever changing. And I think that's what makes weather such an important part of especially landscape and nature photography and wildlife for that matter. 
All right. So we talked about foundation, how important it is to understand the foundations of visual art, the history of it, where it came from, how it came into photography and where we've grown. And then we talked about framework. These are our building blocks. We're talking about adding structure to everything, um, leading lines, foreground details. Um, and then we started to talk about a journey towards finding what is aesthetically pleasing to us. And now we're gonna talk about vision. We want you to shape your vision because this is the point in photography where creativity really begins to grow. Um, how many images do you see at the same location? That is something I ask everybody because each sunrise or sunset um, every subject allows you to choose multiple shots and they're there just waiting for you to find. So this example here was one morning in about a half a mile stretch in winter Yellowstone. And all I had to do is one, to know that I can get multiple shots, two, make creative decisions on what lenses to use, how to use the light that was around me, um, and I can walk away with multiple shots that are extremely different. Here's some backlighting. This is a long exposure that's also backlit. But again, I'm trying to create a vision. And there are certain areas that we can concentrate on or focus on that help us form that vision. Perspective. Another example. So my friend there in Reykjavik, I, I saw him come in really quick there, but I have a lot of Iceland photos in this presentation. But this is Skogafoss waterfall in the south of Iceland down in Vik. And it's very noticeable because it's on the ring road, gets a lot of visitors, all the tour buses, you know, pull into there. And so when I get to a location like this, that's very popular and I still want to take a photo, I will set my tripod up. I had my tripod up here at eye level. I had my Canon 5D Mark IV on and I had the 16 to 35 millimeter. And this waterfall will get rainbows in the afternoon when the sun hits it. And it was just a perfect day. It was all lining up, but there was a hundred people around. So I start yelling out to everybody, I'm famous for this. Hey everybody, I really need to take a photo real quick. If you can give me just a couple of minutes, I'll take a photo of you in front of the waterfall afterwards. And it usually clears most everybody. So that's what I do. So I take this photo, everybody comes back in. I'm busy taking photos of everybody else for a while. My camera doesn't move. And when I'm done, I come back and I say to myself, okay, well, I got the photo I wanted with the wide angle. I took everybody else's photo as I agreed to. And now it's time to do something else. I mean, the waterfall is still there. It's perfect. What can I do differently? And I had a 70 to 200 in my backpack. And I thought, well, I can probably bypass a lot of the people by putting a 70 to 200 on and zooming in. So then I took this photo. Now, notice how different these are. The only thing here that changed was maybe 30 minutes of time. And then what I do, instead of just changing my lens, I'm going to change my position. I walk out to the street and this is the photo I get. Now, all three of these photos were taken probably within 45 to 50 minutes of each other. And look how different they are. Those are different perspectives. But I also know that by moving myself, by changing my lens, that there are possibilities out there that I can capture to create new images, even if it's the same location. And knowing that allows me to really grow that vision of a location. That's defining one specific waterfall. I also use patterns a lot. Um, you know, patterns and landscapes or street photography, just about anything not only help us fine tune our eyes, but they can create some of the most compelling photos. Patterns to me are like lines. They are created to stop your eye from moving and to pay attention. And I've said this so many times, not everything needs to be a grand landscape. Sometimes just the light or the lines themselves or even the color 
are all that is needed to tell a story. Everyone, all of us are gonna go through stages during our journey through photography and the subjects and the styles, they're gonna change with time and with experience and the journey itself should truly never end. What might be your style today might be completely different in a few years and that is good. That is how we define ourselves as artists. Because artists, you know, we never stop growing. We just evolve. Throughout history, artists evolve. So as an artist, we get to do what we want to do. <laughs> and one way to really challenge your artistry and your vision, challenge your vision to think differently is by working on abstracts. Some people love abstracts and some people don't. I always encourage people to work on it because it ultimately changes the way that you look at things. And I think that's important. You can challenge your creativity by playing with abstracts because this actually is where your creativity will take off the most. Abstracts, there's no realism in them whatsoever. And whether you're the artist trying to achieve it or the viewer trying to understand it, it's a matter of seeing things differently. There's no realism here anymore. And that is actually a step towards chaos. So finding the unusual, finding the beauty that exists within that, it's a place to learn. You learn to master your vision. And more importantly, you learn the tools needed to achieve them. Your photography here with abstract will easily become fine art um, and it becomes yours and rarely can be duplicated by others. And I think that's what's so amazing. It's the way you begin to see and communicate nature and the world that you live in in your very own style. Ah, oh, simplify. All right, we're not as busy as we were a year ago. <laughs> We will be soon, but the world is still a busy place, right? So there is very little that shows the beauty of nature as well as simplicity. The impact of a simple subject cannot be outweighed artistically by any grandeur or convey a story more powerfully than just plain simplicity. Beauty, it's in the light, it's in the shapes, it's in the color of nature's palette. And it is here in these moments that we can find peace within our work and tranquility in our subjects. This is where we can easily connect with the natural world one-on-one -on -one to discover. And that is something that defines the artist within all of us. It's there if you're a technical photographer and you're looking to find the artist, practice simplicity. It lies within all of us. And I have learned that people typically come from the artistic side, they come from the technical side, rarely both. If you do, that's wonderful. Um, but you have to challenge yourself to grow. And I want you to look at things differently. You know, every photographer has a journey to take and one that will go on for a lifetime, I hope. And we are always learning and looking for new ways to photograph. The best thing that we can do to improve our photography is to allow our vision to grow. But that also begins with knowing and understanding fundamental composition for these fundamental theories and design elements to be implanted in your mind without ever having to think about it again. Because that is when we really get to focus on creativity and we begin to break all those rules we learned about. And that is how we grow as photographers. Thank you. Thank you very much. So great. let's see if anybody has any questions. Uh, oh, we have tons of questions. Awesome. <laughs> um, I was trying to hold them to the end, but awesome. we do have a lot of questions. So um, 
you kind of touched on this throughout the presentation, but someone was asking, there are many famous photographers who are known for their personal aesthetic. Um, do you think it's important to develop a personal aesthetic and do you have any tips for doing that? Yeah, actually, I think that developing your own style is important. Now, there are so many artists out there, not only fine artists, visual artists, now photographers as artists, that it can be very hard to find your very own style that hasn't somewhat been learned from the style and visions of others. I think the most important thing you can do is to do it for yourself, number one. And I, I truly believe that. If you are learning and trying to grow as a photographer and become a photo artist, you have to be happy and comfortable with what you're doing. Um, yes, most people will become very well known based on a style that they develop. But it's not the only way to get exposure as a photographer. You have to get out there and photograph a lot. Um, and you have to put your work out there for critique and make sure that people are seeing that. That's actually really important. I'm not sure that answered the question. I hope it yeah. did. I, I just really want to make sure that everyone is, one, you do it for yourself. And two, you try, you explore, you learn from different photographers what they're doing play with it a little bit, see if you like it, see if you can change it a little bit, make it your own. Right. Um, and this is kind of a two-part question. So what post processes do you use? And someone else asked, do you wait a while to process or do you go back to process images for adjustments? Oh, okay. Good questions. Well, I use Lightroom in Photoshop, but I primarily use Lightroom only. Um, except if it's for my black and white. So let's just take everything aside from black and white. I will process in Lightroom. Usually like if I'm on a shoot, I just got back from the Everglades and I download, download my images every night and I, I start to edit them. So I, I have an editing process that I'll talk about here for just a second before I finish answering the question. But when I'm in Lightroom, I use the five-star method of choosing the best photos. Now, I learned a long time ago in my previous career that um, you use the rating system as a process of elimination. In other words, when I go into Lightroom, I'm not saying this image is a one, this one gets a two, I think this one's a five. That's actually not the way it was designed um, back in the film days to use. So what I do is if I like it, I go through that round of images. If it's good, the first time I look at it, it gets a one and one star. And then I can select just the one stars to look at. I go through the round again. If it's still strong and compelling and catching my, my eye like that, it gets a two. Then I go to three, then four, then five. So it's more of a process of elimination than rating it from the beginning. And I truly believe, one, it was designed to be that way. Two, it's hard to judge what's a one, a two, a three, a four, or five just by looking at it side by side. If you continue to come back to it, it may eventually become a five, but you have compared a narrower amount of photos to judge that by. So yes, I download and I look at my images almost every time, um, every evening when I get back in. Sometimes it's late and I don't get the opportunity to do that. But usually by the time I'm done with a location, I have images that are at least rated through threes. And I take a little time after I get to that rating of three because that's where I really have to pay attention to a lot more detail. If it's made round three, it's a strong image. But for me to process an image, it's going to be a five. And that takes a little more separation from the photo and, and because of course we're naturally and emotionally attached to them very quickly. So I give myself a couple of days and I'll come back and look at only the threes, which ones are gonna make it to round four. Once they're round four, I'm gonna give it another day or so and I'm gonna come back and say, okay, fresh eyes, the emotional um, attachment is starting to fade a little bit. I can look at it objectively and then I choose my fives and now I know it's time to process. So I do process in Lightroom. I have found that it has evolved quite a bit, very well over the years. So I like Lightroom and all the adjustments I can make. And I will go into Photoshop if I have to do any kind of distortion correction or, or touch up cleanup. If I get dust on my lens, it's much easier to clean up in Photoshop. And if you have Lightroom, you probably have Photoshop too as well. So I just find it easier there. 
Now, for my black and white work, I do some pre-processing in Lightroom, um, but I go into Photoshop with those images. I will work with luminosity masks. I will work with dodging and burning to create that sense that I'm trying to communicate. The black and white work for me is very different. It comes from a place of mood for me. So a lot of my images tend to be either very light, very bright, white, little bit of dark, high key, or they're very low key. I rarely do anything in the middle, but that's an artistic approach. And it's usually a mood that I'm in or the way I felt when I photographed it. So I hope that answered that question. Yes. <laughs> Okay. So you have also a ton of questions about the different equipment you use from the camera, the lens, Lightroom, um, tripods. Is there a place where you list on your website, like all of your favorite yes. equipment? Yeah. So if you go into the about page for me, I list all of my gear that I have. And I do carry a lot of gear with me, though not on my back. I used to try and carry it all on my back. Now I, I might take a lot of equipment to a location. Um, I'm going to be in Death Valley for three weeks, so I pretty much have a backpack and, a, and then a carry-on think tank bag with just about everything I think I'm going to use, but I'm not going to carry it all to each session. I actually find that by choosing one or two lenses to go out and photograph, it, it almost forces me to look through that particular lens to find the art versus always changing. So um, I will say that as a Canon user, the Canon 5D Mark IV, my primary landscape, I also have the Canon 5DR. Um, and for my wildlife, it's Canon 1DX Mark II. And I have everything from the 1124, 1635, 2470, 24105, 70 to 200, 1 to 400, and the 800 millimeter for wildlife. I have some lens babies that I was playing with this summer. I have other Canon macros, but most everything is Canon, Stingray filters, which I'm a firm believer in their glass. It is fantastic. And, and the lack of coloring or the tonality on their glass. That's what I like about them the most. And I always believe too, that it's not necessarily all the gear that you have, um, but if you're using gear in the field, be sure to use the right gear for the job. You know, the more information that you have in your raw file, the better it's going to reproduce and print. And I think that's very important. So I make sure that I have all these tools with me to do that. But you can find that gear list, which I rattled off pretty quickly. I'm sure there's more. <laughs> <laughs> that's on my website on the about page <laughs> and if someone wanted to go to your website it's jennifer king photography right it's, dot com it's or photo jennifer king photo dot com it might be photography i'm not sure i have a few of them but the main page everything points to jennifer king photo dot com okay. so that's where you'll find me <laughs> perfect um so i'm going to rattle off a few more questions quickly um so what Let's see. Oh, you said you use luminosity masks. Do you use a panel? And if so, which one? Uh, actually, Randy Wilson gave me a luminosity mask. He's a photographer that I work with and he created one for me. So that's the one I use. Perfect. Um, do you ever use your phone for pictures? Oh, sure. All the time. Absolutely. <laughs> now you can. <laughs> I know. They take fantastic photos. They really do. You know, I still like the art behind the camera and the lenses. So there's two kinds of art here. You can create visual art that's very compelling and very good with an iPhone or with a phone. Um, but it, maybe I'm a little old school where I still like the feel of the, you know, big heavy lens and the lens, you know, the camera and everything else. It was kind of like when we made the switch from film to digital, we were resistant, of course, but once we did, it was like, oh, this is awesome. And so I kind of like that right now with the cell phones. Yeah. Cell phones take great photos and I do use them sometimes, Yeah, but I'll probably stay old school and carry all the gear. <laughs> <laughs> It's a good workout. Um, what percentage of your images make it to a three or higher? I would say on average, three or higher, probably 25%. And out of those, I will have 10% that are fives. Great. So I think that's a good goal, you know, and sometimes it's hard to choose. And if you are having a struggle in choosing which ones, just give it more time. It means you haven't visually separated from it emotionally quite yet. So the longer you let it sit, 
the more you go through it, the more objective you can be. I ask myself questions like, is it effective? Does it work? Am I communicating something well? Oftentimes, you know, there'll be a few that are so similar that it's hard to choose which one is better. But when you are viewing just those groups side by side, because they may have a four star, it's much easier to go through them at a very quick pace. And I actually do. I go through these images at a quick pace. It'll be one, two, three, four, because I know that if my eye doesn't catch attention to that image in less than a split second, it's not going to work. That's a and skill. That's I think I would spend too long just staring. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you use any programs or softwares outside of Lightroom or Photoshop? No. I, well, I have used Topaz. I've been using that. I was working um, this summer from my deck. <laughs> I started photographing with lens babies and doing some macro work, which I don't do a lot of, but I had a great creative challenge this summer doing. It was a lot of fun. And I say that to everybody. Find something outside of your comfort zone. If you want to grow and change, find something different. If you like photographing flowers, it's time to go photograph cars. You know, if you like photographing landscapes, it's time to, you know, photograph people. If you do something out of your comfort zone, ultimately you're going to learn. So that's good advice. I do it all the time, all the time. Okay, I'm going to pull like one or two more over here. Um, do you use a polarizer filter? Yes, I do. Oh, I use a polarizer filter if there are clouds in the sky, always. Or if there is water around and I need to either decrease a little bit of the reflection or darken that a little bit. Uh, I am a firm believer in filters. So my kit contains polarizers. It contain, I use warming polarizers a lot. So there are neutral ones, there are warming ones. The warming ones are a personal preference because I like that warm feel to the places I, I go to and photograph. So that's an artistic preference. Um, I have neutral density filters, everything from a five to a 10 to a 15, and those are for long exposure photography. And then I also use um, graduated neutral density filters and also reverse filters, which are darker um, around the horizon and they get lighter as you go up. And I really believe that filters make a difference. You know, we do have the filter tool in Lightroom, right? We can use it, but you get back to that theory that the more information you have in your raw file, the more natural it's going to look and the better it's going to print, the better your image is going to be. So I use these tools all the time. Great. Okay, last question is, um, do you delete the rest of the images that don't make it into the groups or what do you do with those extra images? I have way too many. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't seem to delete them. However, they will stay on one photo drive, but my other two backup systems, they only back up the fours and the fives, the raw and, um, you know, the processed images. So, yes. I do keep them. I don't know why. It's just really hard. hard to get rid of them. But I have three backups to the images and only the one drive gets everything. It saves everything. <laughs> right. And someone did post your website link um, in the chat. So definitely check out that website link. Um, it's right there. And this was recorded. So we'll be posting this on YouTube in a few days. Um, so please check out the recordings and ask more questions there. I'm sorry, we got so many questions. I couldn't keep up but uh, <laughs> thank you so much for your time and for joining us and that was a great presentation so thank you so much thank you so much it was great to be here and great to see so many wonderful photographers out there from all over the place so yes, hi all in over. Munich, australia <laughs> u.s new orleans <laughs> yeah well amazing. everyone stay safe and look forward to seeing everybody again to share some more creativity and photography yes and enjoy your trip Thank you. <laughs> All right. Bye. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye, everyone.